When it comes to directing, Clive Barker really just popped into the genre, directed things his own unique way, changed it for the better, and peaced out. Besides a couple of shorts in the 70s, Barker only directed three movies, from 1987 to 1995. My English friend put out Hellraiser, Nightbreed, and Lord of Illusions. That's it. Now, of course, he's written a ton more, but I'd argue that each of his three movies has a very distinct visual style, that Clive Barker look, and not to mention since he already wrote them, they bear his bizarre tone and style. And yet, after three movies, just like that, he's gone. And so I often think about this clip of him. At heart, I'm a writer and a painter. I'm a writer and a painter who got lucky and got to make some movies. Now again, I'm not saying Clive Barker is gone. What I'm saying is that he directed three movies and that's it. Dipped his toe, kicked ass, and left. Bon voyage, motherfucker. How talented must you be to just dabble in directing, make some of the best horror out there, and have it amount to nothing more than a side gig? And with only three flicks to consume, this Black Sheep episode isn't on why his last entry into directing is unfairly categorized as a failure, because it's not but more or less on why, out of the three, Lord of Illusions should be as noted as Hellraiser and Nightbreed. Now, yeah, not as good for sure, but if you step back and take it all in, it's closer than others would like to admit. So my friends, sit back, make it old-fashioned, and let's get into why Lord of Illusions is pretty damn great. Let me get this out of the way. I've never read any of Barker's books, comics based on his work, etc. My knowledge is centered exclusively off of his filmography, so I can't comment on how accurate or inaccurate things are. How close Harry DeMore is to his written version, or what his eventual character arc is. Besides Harry debuting in the Books of Blood Volume 6 with the short story The Last Illusion, I know nothing. Private investigator Harry Damore, played by the great Scott Bakula, is winding down in his dingy apartment after an exorcism gone bad. Harry has a specialty for the occult, and after a job went to shit, he's doing what most cops, detectives, or PIs did back in the day. Strip down to his wife, <laughs> pop open a bud, and sulk in a dirty apartment. But once he gets a chance to do an easy insurance fraud gig in LA, he drops his New York apartment and heads out west only to get deep into something far worse than a sprinkle of possession. Touch the darkness no more. Flashback 13 years earlier, an occult is living in the Mojave Desert with their dear leader Nix, played perfectly by Daniel Van Bargen. Nix is a man who wields magical powers, and when we meet him, his intent is on sacrificing a little girl, which will somehow protect his following and grant them the same powers as him. Now, things don't go his way when a few ex-members come back to stop him. It's here that we get some of that Barker charm. After wounding Nyx, enough to bind him, which is a method in which a magical iron mask keeps him and his powers at bay, they bury Nyx deep in the desert, hoping all is well. What Harry stumbles into 13 years later is Nyx's lackey, Butterfield, who escaped the raid on the cult compound, is killing those involved while trying to find the location of his buried leader. In a weird way, Lord of Illusions is a pretty grounded film, or at least more accessible, and that's what makes it kind of feel so different for me. And besides magic, of course, Lord of Illusions is a hard-boiled PI story, in the same vein as the classics from the 40s and 50s. A story that goes dark and pretty damn wild as things progress. Horror noir is something we sadly get very little of. A few modern classics like Angel Heart, The Wicker Man, and Seven prove when done well, these go on to live in the minds of genre and non-genre fans alike. But we don't hear a lot about Lord of Illusions, which deserves a spot next to the classics. Okay, maybe magic wasn't quite as popular or cool as bondage-clad hell demons or even a sympathetic monster world, but besides a few sprinkled in scenes, I mean, this is just a guy trying to do a job, regardless of the supernatural outcome, with the intent on saving a few innocent lives. I mean, think about it like this. Harry Damore isn't necessarily out of his league, and eh, though he gets his ass handed to him a few times, 
He never fails to act and dive headfirst into the madness. Story-wise, Lord stands apart from Barker's other directorial work. Because the lead isn't new to the game, and because of this, we get a unique vibe. The year since Nix was bound and buried, his protege and most promising pupil, Philip Swan, played by Kevin O'Connor, has used his talents to become a rich magician, sort of like David Copperfield, using real magic, pretending it's just an illusion. And the young Dorothea, who he saved years prior, is now the stunning and stoic Famke Jansen. Famke Jansen. Famke Jansen. Who he's married to. It's a little weird. But Dorothea, Philip, and Harry must band together to stop the resurrection of Nyx. Philip is motivated by emotion, and though a talented man, he isn't necessarily a confident one. And this is nailed flawlessly by O'Connor. And I always like this dude. The mummy, deep rising virtuosity, and the masterpiece that is no escape. Also, he's killing it on becoming a god in Central Florida. Bakula playing Harry Damore, which are going to become Barker's big recurring character. In this movie, he has a certain sensitivity to him. I mean, he's supposed to be a broken man, and there are hints of it. But Bakula has a kind sense of self. It makes Harry Damore a different type of hard-boiled P.I. His interpretation of the character, again, I'm not sure how accurate it is compared to the writings, is a welcome change, and one I wish he got to play once more. Daniel Von Barken could play a badass in his sleep and put in a career-defining performance as Nyx. Creepy yet toned down, and he plays Nyx as a man in charge, who is there to get shit done. He wasn't always such a bad guy. It looks like early in his life, he would blindly donate to charity. You know, since they're all the same. I'm supposed to uh, find a charity and throw some of the company's money at it. They all seem the same to me, so what's the difference? Well, I'm sure many will point out the aging CGI, which, for movies that didn't have the Jurassic Park budget, were still trying to figure out how to make them work within a story. And yet, the CGI here isn't that bad. Now, what I mean is that the early 90s CGI had a certain visual style that understood it couldn't be realistic, so it went the way of being stylistic. I think of the lawnmower man and virtuosity, but of course, the practical effects went out every time, as they always do. Nyx's rotting face that has been stained by the Iron Mask, or his third eye, hold up great and look amazing. We get a Ghostbusters 2 nod in the Magician's special room, and the epic last stand in the desert compound. Practical, real, there on set. And like I keep saying, Barker has unique eye that was present in Hellraiser and perfected by the time this came out. I'm impressed that he was able to capture and polish his style so quickly and proficiently. For only three directing credits, Barker doesn't have a slump in the bunch. Barker gave in to a few demands to meet the theatrical cut, but this was all done with the agreement that a director's cut would be released, which it was, quickly. What is surprising is that you can't watch his preferred cut right now. The director's cut runs 121 minutes while the theatrical cuts, 109. So where do we watch his cuts? Let's check out Amazon Prime. Nope. Standard cut. Maybe Blu-ray. So the one cut that you could actually watch is missing a lot of character development, which unsurprisingly adds quite a bit. Probably the best cut scene is a cult which has been living a normal life waiting for the word that Nyx is back. And once it comes, they all kill their family and friends in preparation of his return. And yet, it's a lot of story-centric scenes, not much gore that was left out. Barker had a hell of a time with studio interference on both Nightbreed and Lord of Illusions, with Nightbreed only somewhat recently getting its director's cut. And I'm sure this, plus low box office numbers, contributed to his quick time behind the camera. But man, his small stint really did a lot for the genre. And like a fine wine or a great whiskey, has aged gracefully over time. And though Nightbreed has finally found the audience it deserves, I don't think that Lord of Illusions is quite there yet. Again, a theatrical cut on Amazon Prime, an out-of-print Blu-ray, this deserves much, much better. But when it comes to Clive Barker, I hope we get one more entry in my lifetime. But I'm also wise enough to know that time is a cruel mistress, and there's no better ending than leaving on a high note. And Clive Barker's directing career got the f*** up and left on top.
Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content. And turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.